My name is Irid Ezips, and I've been doing customer success consulting since 2014, helping companies either set up the customer success function and coming up with the right strategic approach of you know, what kind of uh, engagement model they're going to have, what's the organization structure is going to be like, the customer journey map, you know, key indicators, things like that, or work with customer success organizations that are already set up that are looking to optimize something around their operations. So either they're not getting the right results or they're struggling with, you know, showing value internally, struggling with earn, struggling with upsell. Actually, I would say that that's my forte, like value uh, management to customers and uh, increasing upsell. Um, those are two areas that I really love working with customers. And of course, optimizing onboarding, uh, coming up with churn, uh, retention strategies and health scores and you know everything else. It depends really on the type of company that you're in. I think early stage startups or any company where the product is not stable, 50% of the time is because we have outages, we have performance issues, and then we don't have the right people in place or the right processes in place to ensure a positive customer experience when these type of things happen. Uh, the second type of churn that we're seeing is when you do have a good solution, it's stable, but it, maybe it adds a lot of value at the beginning. And after year two, year three, the added value is diminished. And so your product becomes commoditized. And it's very easy for a competitor to come in, knock on the door and say, hey, yeah, we have the same features basically and kind of scoop your business right underneath your feet, so to speak, without you knowing. Third type of solutions is when you have a fair, you know, fairly mature product, you have a fairly mature customer service. However, your customer success function or your strategy around customer success is super reactive. And so, you know, the customer experience is just not the best possible, or you're not really focused on delivering value to customers beyond the solution itself. And so at some point their business grows beyond what the initial requirements were because they don't have the relationship with you. They don't know what else you can add to the table. And so they're just assuming that those additional use cases or functions are something that they can only find outside and they end up churning, leaving you for somebody uh, like another solution that potentially is perceived more mature. Top reasons for churn is the success, you know, the, the customer executive has left. Yeah, sure. But if your solution has been fully embedded in critical processes and you had the relationship as deep and, and uh, breadth of relationship that you needed, most likely you would have champions within your uh, customer's account already championed for you. So this is the type of symptoms that we sometimes see as key churn uh, reasons when your customer success function is not proactive enough to set up the right policies and processes with, with customers to ensure that these kind of things are mitigated for the most part. I talked to a lot of executives around this question and uh, most of them, you know, the number one answer that I get is net retention rate. I think that's a great question. That's very insightful. In general, I think it's the CEO <laughs> that should own the churn. I think there should be some accountability across multiple functions. I think that's what's emerging over the past few years, which is what we're seeing. We're seeing issues with companies not, that are product led and not having the product team own the churn rate. We're seeing uh, sales teams bringing in customers that are completely not aligned with the main business use case that are not a good fit for the company and they churn. And so I think that sales team should be held accountable when we're seeing this kind of issue. And absolutely the customer success team should be held accountable. Anybody that's responsible for post sales. So if you have an onboarding team, they should be accountable for year one churn. Absolutely. If we have a professional services team, for example, if we know that we have a complex product and we have a lot of bugs and outages, we should tie back, you know, how many customers that have experienced outages or are disgruntled about performance issues 
uh, has actually churned so that we can tie that back to the way support is being managed. So I think that putting the, the customer success managers solely responsible for net retention rate or even gross retention rate is problematic. I think almost almost every department could be held accountable to some degree, and it should probably be a number that's tied to, you know, how is the company overall performance and kind of tied to the annual bonus of nearly every employee in the company. The days where you set up customer success to fight churn, you know, that's just so 2013. I think that we have evolved since then, and we, we actually do understand that it's a cross-functional effort. That's one way. Sometimes they really know why they have churn and we can tackle it right away. A lot of times I do an assessment. Uh, sometimes it's a very tactical assessment and sometimes it's a company-wide assessment. Um, so it just depends on, uh, you know, what's their gut feeling around why churn exists. Oftentimes you can do customer interviews and kind of understand why churn is happening from the customer's perspective. And so I would say there's four ways you can tackle it. You can ask the CSMs and then kind of gauge which customers have experienced churn for those key reasons and what was the impact in previous years. So you can see how you progress over time. You can ask customers and then you can do a company-wide assessment as well. So what we're seeing in the market is when you have a the, what we call the long tail customer cohort. Imagine that you have a company, you have a 10, 20% of the customers bringing 80% of the revenue, and then the remaining 80%, you know, is just 20% of the revenue. We call that the long tail. So what I've seen in the market is that for the long tail, you would probably set up a retention team, and you'll have three basic things why customers call you to cancel the contract and for a, depending on the situation you will have a different playbook on how to win their business back and so depending on where the customer is in the like at a very high level at least is it a long tail or a you know high-end strategic customers you should have a, a very specific strategy in place on how are you going to retain them I think one of the main issues is that we don't track. We just have a, a, a gut feeling around what happens with customers. We hear customers being disgruntled, or we know that there's like uh, the conversion rate from pilot to paid customer is low. Uh, but I, I think that, you know, we know that we're not doing great, but I, I find that most, most companies that are not doing great are not really good at measuring most of the, of the important stuff. They don't have their leading indicators well-defined. They might have some lagging indicators defined like customer health score and gross churn, maybe net retention rate, and that's it. Maybe NPS, that's it. I think if that's all you're doing, you better have a killer product and an easy use case and super sticky solution so you don't have to. But if that's not the case and you are experiencing customers leading you and it does hurt your business, then, you know, the first thing you need to do is ask yourself, am I tracking the right things, the right metrics, the right processes? Um, do, am I driving accountability by monitoring what the team is doing? Uh, there's a lot of things that you can track, but you're not probably not having good visibility to what's going on. And then you can't really share the value you're adding to other teams. You probably don't have great cross-functional collaboration. You probably have murky roles, um, unclear roles and responsibilities. There's like a lot of stuff. So you can't really measure, you don't have KPIs, specific KPIs for each team. Like there's a lot of like symptoms when there's churn. And most of it I find has to do with, are we tracking anything? Or if we are, are we tracking enough? Are we tracking the right things? And so I find that a lot of times management is lacking data data-driven decisions capabilities. And so I would just double click on that. Is this the case? And if not, then maybe maybe we do have some processes that we basically just need to roll our sleeves and, and fix and maybe add some tools in place so we can scale. Is it possible to start early enough so that the... Well, renewal process is really about having an internal conversation first to discuss, you know, what is our projections or forecast of renewal? And so when should you start internally start talking about it? 
I think the concept of when do you start is off from the from the get go. Um, I think the highest mature customers that uh, I've worked with actually had a place where the team can constantly update their forecast for renewal anytime during the year. Meaning they open the renewal opportunity as soon as the previous contract was closed. And so when you do that and you commit the team to update this on a regular basis and you hold them accountable for updating it and you're reviewing it with them on a regular basis, your projections are probably going to be off by one or two percent versus 10, 20 percent. If you do that on, on a consistent basis, you probably have a little bit better probability to detect when churn, even partial churn, by the way, and then you can handle a mitigation strategy a lot sooner. So if I start the renewal process six months ahead of time by just having an internal discussion, it might be too late because the actual the customer has decided that they wanted to churn nine months prior to the renewal that you just don't know. Maybe you missed that opportunity to really effectively and time, timely manner uh, address the issue. I find that companies that put in place a success plan that's not three months out, but actually a year or two out, have better probability of renewing, even if the actualized ROI is lower than the renewal rate, meaning the customer is going to pay you for what they think they're going to get in a year or two from now versus you know, are you giving me the ROI to justify the renewal for next year, given nothing is going to happen? You know, that's a much harder sell on renewals. So there's a few tricks that you can do to secure the renewal. It's not necessarily around timing, but are we having the right discussions and are they done by the with the right people and not a week before? <laughs> kind of want to do it a few months before. Um, and then am I gauging that throughout the life cycle of the customer? I think it's down to communication skills. Uh, you know, when a customer expresses that they want to cancel, some people don't handle it very well. They are, they're not equipped to handle that conversation. They might feel like they themselves as a CSM failed the customer. And so it becomes personal instead of, you know, approaching the conversation with a professional manner to understand the reasons to come in with a sense of, can we fix this? What can we do? Or at least collect the feedback so that you can bring it back to the team. So from a strategic standpoint, we can fix things in the customer journey. Probably the biggest mistake is when customer success leaders are not coaching their customer success managers or don't provide training on how to handle difficult customer conversations. Well, I would say, um, first of all, Try to analyze why churn happens. What are the top 10 reasons for churn? I think when you do that, you can actually show management why is it important to handle that situation. So again, if you um, can quantify that a churn reason was because a feature was missing in the product and that caused a $10 million churn overall last year, then you're more likely to get that feature fixed or added to the product roadmap. Or if it's because the onboarding team lacks bandwidth or resources, then you can pinpoint and pitch why you need additional ones because it's not just about being profitable with your customers, it's about you know saving $10 million next year. Second of all, look at your strategy. Do you have policies and processes in place to address issues that cause churn? So for example, if your number one issue is that customers churn due to merger and acquisition, which is completely out of your control, really take stock. Do you have the right, what we call a playbook in place on how to handle things when a merger and acquisition happens? Uh, these are the two things that I would look at. Do we have the right playbook? Do we have the right investment uh, from the management team? And can I prove why I need it? And then if it's for the low touch customers, uh, I would say, do you need a retention team? Yeah, I think most companies, most leaders track, they think they track churn by tracking gross retention rate, but they don't drill down. They don't track reasons. They don't quantify the impact of each reason so that they can justify the investment, 
those are the kind they don't track leading indicators so that they can show that they're improving towards reduction in churn even though we can't see those numbers change yet because it takes six to nine months to actually start seeing the, that it's, that's why they're called lagging indicators so those are the things that we need to fix immediately as customer success leaders and and ceos by the way this should be top of mind for any company that has uh, some churn that they want to diminish mm-hmm.